strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Grace and peace to you in the name of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in whose spirit we worship this day. The Lord be with you. This morning is Easter. Welcome to worship Zion United Methodist Church on online worship on Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. Christ our Lord is risen. It's good to see everyone in worship. I look forward to worshiping with you. And as we prepare for worship together, let us continue by our scriptural call to worship. This morning, your liturgist is April, and you will follow along with Lauren as she reads the words to us. Let us begin with our scriptural call to worship today. Our call to worship today comes to us from Psalm 114. When the Israelites escaped from Egypt, when the family of Jacob left that foreign land, the land of Judah became God's sanctuary, and Israel became his kingdom. The Red Sea saw them coming and hurried out of their way. The water of the Jordan River turned away. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What's wrong, Red Sea? that made you hurry out of their way? What happened, Jordan River, that you turned away? Why mountains did you skip like rams? Why hills like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. He turned the rock into a pool of water. Yes, a spring of water flowed from solid rock. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. So. And now as we continue our worship, we have an opportunity to join our voices with hundreds, if not thousands, and hundreds of thousands of Methodists around the world. The United Methodist Church Discipleship Ministries have put together a video of voices coming together to sing Charles Wesley's hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. The words will be at the bottom of the screen, all provided by the global United Methodist Church. Let us join our voices with them as we sing of our risen Lord and Savior.
A reading from the book of Matthew. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to them. Do not be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead, just as he, would, he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thank be to God. God. And now I'd like to visit with the children for a moment for a children's sermon. I have a question for you as, you, as we begin this morning. Have you ever been frightened by something that you didn't expect? All right, come on now, kids. Just because I'm not in the room with you doesn't mean you don't have to answer. You've got to answer. Answer the question, have you ever been frightened by something that you didn't expect? Sure, that's a common thing. We all have. We've all been startled before. In my life, I've come to discover that I'm actually pretty sneaky. Even though I don't intend to be, I startle people from time to time. I startle even my own family, April, Ryan, Lauren, all without trying. And that was just this last week. I've also started a bunch of people that I've had an opportunity to work with over the years. And uh, didn't mean to, didn't try to, but that's what happened. Usually when people get startled, something occurs that they weren't expecting and they become afraid in a, in a quick moment. Usually fear is what happens when something you didn't expect occurs. In the Bible story that Ryan just read to us and that we just heard, the two women who went to visit the tomb, they were startled. They were frightened by something that they didn't expect. And that's why the first words from the angel were, don't be afraid. And then later, they saw the very person alive who was supposed to be dead talk about being startled. Jesus was in front of them and he said the same thing first that the angel said. He said, don't be afraid. And this is an important part of the story because it reminds us that even though we feel fear, we can feel less fear. Even if it means something happens different than what we expect because nothing happens beyond what God expects. God is never surprised. He always knows what's going to happen next. He knows exactly what's going to happen and when it's something that's not so good, that's usually when God is most near to us. We don't always see it. We don't always notice it, but that's most likely the case. God is always near, even and especially when we're most afraid. Let's pray together. You can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for helping us, thank you for helping us overcome, our fear. overcome our fear. Thank you for always being near. Thank you for always being near. And thank you for Easter. And thank you for Easter. We love you. Amen. We love you. Amen. All right, kids, and now it's time for me to begin uh, my Easter sermon. Some years ago, two, two former high school friends caught up with each other. The first friend noticed by the other friend's appearance that he had joined the military since they had last spoken. And so eventually he asked, so how's life in the Navy? That's okay, was the less than enthusiastic reply. When I enlisted, I was excited by the idea that they told me I would get to see the world. But I've been out of the uh, continental U.S. for two years now and haven't seen anything of the world. Really? asked the friend, rather dismayed for him. Really? came back the response. I've just got to get out of that submarine. Indeed, seeing the world is a bit hard from fathoms below sea level. This Navy man was a bit more than disappointed that his expectation had heretofore gone unmet. Unmet expectations can really get us down. I'm thinking about some of the unmet expectations we're experiencing these days. It just was announced this past week 
that many of our schools won't continue their school year whatsoever. All the schools in, in Missouri won't finish this school year. And I'm, rem- I'm reminded of the, of the students who participate in sports every year. They get together with their teammates and practice and become a better team and be- get better at their own actions on court or on the field because of their time with their friends and playing like a team. They lift weights, but maybe they don't have access now to the gym. And they're not going to get to experience this year's extracurricular activities, even beyond sports, choir, music lessons, all kinds of things where people aren't able to make this year as best as it could have been for them. And their expectations about what would happen aren't met. I think about people whose identities are wrapped up in their careers, and they think about their value comes down to what they do for a living. Maybe they can't put their hand to what they're good at right now because economic situations are such that they just can't go to work. And their expectation of their worth and value is is limited. And that's not true in God's kingdom, but that's how they see themselves. And they have unmet expectations of what this spring could mean. I myself am disappointed in the lack of baseball and the ability to get to get to go outside with other people and participate in outside activities. But I'm most mindful of our high school seniors and college seniors, college graduates, graduate school graduates, people who won't be able to celebrate the culmination of all their educational experiences and maybe athletic experiences along with that. This will be this the song that they process into, an outfit that they get to wear, caps they get to throw in the air. Specific people win awards, and everyone is there to see it. And those expectations aren't going to happen for them this year. Unmet expectations can really get us down. But I want to talk to us about, even though we find ourselves in this time of life, a time that none of us have ever seen before, when we look at the first Easter, we see that everyone in the scenario, except for Jesus himself, had expectations that weren't fulfilled. Unmet expectations are common, and they were common throughout the story of Jesus' passion and leading up to that final Easter. And so I want to go through some of those stories in detail, take a look at some of the characters and some of the circumstances. You may never have seen unmet expectations in the passion story of Jesus before, but they're all over the place. Beginning on that Holy Thursday night, when they began the Last Supper together, the disciples expected to come into their greatness because of their following of Jesus. That was something that they argued about amongst the tab- at the table amongst each other. They were saying uh, which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom once Jesus assumed the throne because that's what they thought, each one of them. That's what they thought was going to happen. And so they began to argue with themselves the role that they would play. Uh, that didn't work out that way, though. Those expectations were unmet. And Judas... On Holy Thursday this, this year, I offered something online of an understanding of what I think about Judas and how he went through uh, the experience of, of betraying Jesus and how he responded to that. That may or may not be the case, but regardless of what was actually happening inside of Jesus, Judas that would have led up to his betrayal of Jesus, he certainly didn't get what he was after. He goes back to the priest that he, he gained 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus, and he throws it back at them. I didn't intend on betraying an innocent man, he tells them, and they don't seem to much care. Unmet expectations. Whatever he was expecting, it didn't happen the way he expected it would. And then another one of the disciples, Peter, he expected to remain loyal to Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, he tells Jesus, even if everybody else falls away, I'm not going to, Lord. And Jesus tells them, yeah, in fact, you'll deny me three times this very night that you even know me. And after Jesus was arrested, part of the the process of the Jewish authorities attempting to work out this eventual crucifixion was to move him in front of one provincial leader into another. And at one point he finds himself in, in front of King Herod. And King Herod had heard about the kinds of things that Jesus would do, the miracles he would perform. And so he was excited that Jesus was in front of him, and he expected Jesus to entertain him and perform a miracle, almost like a magician or a court jester. Of course, that's not who Jesus was. And so he was disappointed. Jesus just stood there, didn't do anything, didn't say anything. His expectations were unmet. 
Another person that Jesus had to answer to was Pilate. Pilate expected that when, when Jesus, who he couldn't understand a crime that Jesus had committed at all, when Jesus was offered up as that one person a year that Pilate would hand over to the people to be freed, it was either him or Barabbas, and Barabbas was known to be a murderer. <laughs> Between these two, they've got to accept Jesus returned to them. So Pilate stands before the people and says, would you rather have Jesus returned back to you or, or the prisoner Barabbas who's a murderer? And he didn't get what he expected. They claimed Jesus instead of uh, to be crucified, and they claimed Barabbas to be freed. And the Jews themselves, they were looking. They were looking for what they understood as an earthly Messiah one week prior to Easter Sunday. They were praising him. Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They wanted him to be their king, and now that didn't work out. And so they were ridiculing him on the cross because they didn't get what they expected. And then in the midst of their ridicule, maybe they thought they could taunt him into being the king, but mostly they were just mad because they didn't get what they were expect expecting. And the Jewish leaders who had orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus to begin with, they expected that his disciples, after he had uh, died and was placed in a tomb, they had expected his disciples would try to steal his body. So they went to the Roman uh, authorities and said, we need you to place some guards at the tomb because the disciples might come and try to steal the body, but that's not what happened. They didn't get what they expected. The body still disappeared, but it's because the Lord was risen. And even as they brought the temple guards or the Roman authority guards to come down to the tomb, it didn't work out the way they wanted in that regard either because the body still went missing. And then the women who came to the tomb they expected to anoint a dead body with ar aromatic spices, but they found the body missing. They, too, had unmet expectations. Now, often we are, we're devastated by the unmet expectations in our lives. Maybe most of you would refer to your circumstances about what you just can't uh, be a part of right now, what you're going to miss out on this spring. Maybe you'd refer to that as being devastating, rather devastating. And most of the time, that's exactly the appropriate response to have. But what an understatement it would be to refer to Easter as just incomplete if we focused on the numerous unmet expectations throughout the story and stopped right there. Of course, it's not just incomplete. Though we've covered about eight unmet expectations in the story of Jesus' passion, and there's actually more, of course not. that's not the point. The point of Easter has always been that Jesus through his death and resurrection, created a bridge between humanity and God so that we may join God in joyful fellowship and that now we can come freely into God's presence because of what Jesus has done. That's the point of Easter. Because in God's kingdom, unmet expectations can lead to or even, even be a part of the best thing ever. Now that phrase gets used a lot. This is the best day ever. That was the best ice cream ever. But truly, the best day in all creation was Resurrection Sunday, that first Easter Sunday morning. But I'm not talking about the beauty of unmet expectations in the resurrection alone. There were other unmet expectations that were beautiful and precious and amazing. The Pharisees expected to stop the followers of Jesus by killing him. That's what they said. That's what they plotted to do. If we kill Jesus, then this whole movement goes away, and it would be better for the nation. That's what they thought. But that didn't work. It didn't work out uh, spectacularly, in fact. We're still here. We're still keeping it going, following after Jesus to this very day, nearly 2,000 years later. Talk about unmet expectations. And then next to the resurrection, I would say that's one of the best unmet, expect unmet expectations of all time. A more personal, beautiful unmet expectation is offered with the thief on the cross who asked to be remembered as Christ entered into his kingdom. He probably expected that his last moments of life would be full of pain and dread. He was a thief after all. He got a punishment, and he's on his way to his death. Yet there he is, carrying his cross alongside Jesus and journeying to his death with none other than the Savior of the world. In the midst of his earthly justice, he walks with heaven's grace personified. His reasonable expectations of fear for what happens after death were overcome by Jesus' simple words, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Again, not what he was expecting. 
in additional to the beauty of Jesus' willing sacrifice and unfathomable resurrection, in the moments before he dies while hanging on the cross, he prays for those who are persecuting him. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. What humility. What love poured out for those who would expect to be cursed by him or for him to free himself and proclaim his kingship in the way they expected. It was one or the other. But those expectations were unmet, both of them. And instead, what was offered is the clearest, most beautiful picture of how far God's forgiveness extends. Then in the rest of the story that was read for today, the women, the women who came to address the needs of Jesus' deceased body, were met with the news that they couldn't have expected, the news that the angel spoke to the women. I know you are looking for Jesus, for, who, for him who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. These are the most amazing stories in Scripture, and so many of them are unmet expectations or expectations that were overcome by the Spirit of God. Therefore, it's easy to see that the totality of God's plans offers more beauty of God's love in spite of real, unmet expectations than the world had ever seen or has ever seen since. Though many expectations didn't come to fruition in the unfolding of this story, the accomplishment of the resurrection exceeded beyond any and all expectations. Jesus created this wholly unexpected way of proving his ultimate kingship and providing salvation for us which is why Paul proclaims in the opening of his letter to the Corinthians, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God in that he overcomes not only the problem of our sin, but resurrects, conquering the power of death and the wisdom of God. It's a plan that people didn't see coming. It's a plan that they couldn't have known about. So many of their own unmet expectations and unmet expectations that were exceeded by God's plan. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, for my part, I have my own experiences of unmet expectations. And probably the most prominent unmet expectation in my entire life deals with the death of my brother, Sean. And not just the fact that he died, but the events surrounding his death. In 1989, my dad lost his job the job that we had moved from Oklahoma to St. Louis, the job that had taken us there and had set up our life, he goes in for a raise and instead comes out without his job. Not because of anything that he had done. The, the company took some time, but it eventually completely folded, and he was just one of the first. But talk about unmet expectations. Shortly thereafter, in the months that followed, we were doing a number of things to try to raise money and, and work together as a family. My brother was working in a movie theater, and he found out that they were recently looking for people to work overnight to clean the theater. It would happen once a week, and so on Saturday evenings to Sunday mornings, we would wake up early, go to the theater, wipe down the countertops, vacuum, clean the bathrooms. As a 13-year-old, I remember having a pretty good time picking up leaf blowers and blowing up all the empty cups and the uh, popcorn on that slanted concrete floor, just blowing it all down to the front where you'd then sweep it into a, a big bag and throw all the trash away. And then you'd mop between the chairs. It wasn't that bad, but it's because we had to. We needed that money. And on one evening, my brother had been staying the night at his best friend's house and was coming back home and fell asleep at the wheel. He evidently fell asleep with his foot on the accelerator and was driving rather fast whenever he left the road. Sideswipes the tree, which pushed him really hard into the next one. There's some miraculous events that took place around his car accident and how he survived that. But he did. He had a gash above his eye. He had a dislocated shoulder, some broken bones in his, his hand and his thumb. But he survived. And God used that difficulty in his life brought him to a, a full and complete understanding of his role in God's kingdom and on earth, and he really enjoyed how people took care of him and those who ministered to him in the, in the medical profession, and that changed his desire. He, he was purposing to grow up and become a nurse. He graduated high school a year and a half later, had started college in the fall of 91. 
and in the summer of 92 began to have pains in his legs, pains that would later be diagnosed as childhood leukemia. Diagnosed in August, and by December, he passed away. It wasn't because of the leukemia. It was actually in remission. He had gone back to the hospital and, and gotten some other infections, and that eventually took his life. And in, in between this time of, of uh, him having cancer and not having cancer and then, and then tr struggling, he makes his way into the ICU. And the journeys of my parents and I going to the hospital and spending time with him and then coming back home. They asked me one time, do you expect, are you prepared? Have you thought about if Sean were to die? And I said, I, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, it's only been a couple of years or so since his car accident. I don't, we don't know why he survived that. Why would he die here? It's the last thing I expected. Why would God take him now if he didn't take him before? Sean's death took place about two and a half, three and a half weeks before my 16th birthday. I finished out that school year, but very shortly thereafter, I, I began to struggle. Six months later, I, I was back at school, not having a good time, and that led me to being on antidepressants and seeing a therapist. And one time, as I was talking with this therapist, he said, it seems like to me that you lived your life in proximity to your brother, and that was so true. It was so true that whatever my brother did helped me to understand what I would do. It didn't make any difference necessarily. I didn't follow everything he would do, but I would determine what I liked based on what he did or didn't like. And without him being there, my anchor in life, I didn't know what I could do. I was content to be Sean's little brother. I was content to be in his shadow. He did well for me. He opened doors for me in life. And so I was content to be number two. And without him there, I, I was no one's number two. And I didn't know how to be number one. And so I struggled for a while. But as I think about where I am now and what my call is for ministry, my call is to order the life of the church, to lead the people of God, to raise the flag of Christ, to carry the cross of Christ and lead a group of people from one point to another as God would discern, as God would tell me, to be sure that we get to that destination. God's preferred future for us, me to be out front and to lead people in God's kingdom. And I think how God took me from a person who was content to be in the shadows to being someone who would rather lead than do anything else in the church. And that's who I am today. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that there's anything beautiful in my brother's death because I don't believe that. But what God can do, what we see in a moment and what God can do over time are two different things. God's plans were not thwarted at any moment in time. God was not surprised by my brother's death. And he, he used it in my life to turn me into something that is beneficial for his kingdom. I didn't see that coming, though I live with unmet expectations, unmet expectations that to this day I still live with and I still long for. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know there is a day when I will have those very expectations met and I will come face to face not only with my Lord and Savior but with those who have passed before me. We'll get to see our relatives again and I will see my brother again and that expectation is still yet to come. All of this because of Jesus' resurrection. Despite how we may see things in a moment, despite how we see things right now, though we can't be together. If you were to tell me that I would be on my first Easter Sunday preaching to an empty room here at Zion Church and that that would be satisfactory, maybe the best way things should happen, I'd have, that's just crazy. I'd have thought I was an utter failure. Talk about unmet expectations. It's happening right now. Despite how we see things, though, God's ways are higher than our ways. And he may well have more in store for us than what we can expect in and of ourselves. For God, as Scripture says, God is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask, think, or Im imagine. Because out of crucifixion, God brings resurrection. This proves that God is at work even when we can't see it. God is doing something even when we have reason to believe that he's done. The disciples had every reason to believe their hopes for a Messiah were dashed. It just wasn't true. It wasn't real. But God wasn't done. Jesus was to be resurrected. So don't let your response to unmet expectations overshadow the beauty that God can bring out of them. The sermon title is The Beauty of Unmet 
expectations. Not the beauty in unmet expectations. It's not beautiful to have devastation take place. But God can still bring beauty out of it, just like he can bring resurrection from death. Any reasonable disappointment we have is simply not the end of the story. God is not done yet, and we know this. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Lord God, our hearts are heavy many times in our lives, and this day they are lighted by the fact of Easter. But they are heavy for other aspects of life. I pray, O oh God, that we reach up in faith to what you can provide and help us to look past this moment in time. There are many whose burdens we carry, many who don't understand how life works all the time. Because of this COVID virus, because of social distancing, we miss out on a number of things. We miss each other terribly. We miss opportunities. We miss entertainment. We miss business opportunities and ways to move our families forward. But God, you hold the future to help us not to be overcome and overwhelmed by unmet expectations and help us to look past it to the one who knows and is never surprised. Give us a sense of your glory and help us to proclaim that glory to the world. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And it would be foolish for us not to hold on to him. Let us not lose heart. Help us, O oh God, increase our faith, increase our fervency and trust in you. Help us to hold fast to your word and to each other. Help us to reach out to each other. Lord, we, we lift up those to you that we can't come into contact with. Maybe those who are suffering with cancer, those we know who might even have this coronavirus. We pray that you would draw close to them, touch them at the point of their need, and be with us as we struggle with grief and, and mourning. We think about those who are close to the, the medical profession and those who are dealing with the bodies, maybe of those who are deceased, a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation, those who are considered essential employees and, and are out in the midst of it and, and concerned about themselves. Would you provide each of them a hedge of protection? There are more worries and concerns on our hearts as a people than can be listed here today, but you know each one of them, and so we lift them up to you. And we proclaim the blood of Jesus Christ over each one, bringing victory to us all. And we know that because our Lord and Savior is risen, which we celebrate this day. So we leave all of these things in the powerful hands of Jesus Christ, the one who overcomes death and reunites us with the Father. In his name we pray. Amen. And as we take an opportunity to respond to God's wonderful glory, and wonderful resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. We can respond with our tithes and offerings. Again, the address will be listed on the screen, and we have an opportunity to receive your checks. Many of you are dropping by the church, and that is just fine. Drop uh, your check or an envelope by the church, and we'll receive it that way as well. Let us continue to respond in our hearts as well as we listen to an offertory brought to us by our uh, music director, Jamie, and her husband, Chip Sepulvedo, as they offer us glorious day. <laughs>
Paul says in Ephesians 3 as our benediction for today. When I think of all this, and when he says all of this, he's talking about everything that God has done in Christ, especially his resurrection. He says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand how wide and how long, how high and how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Happy Easter, everyone. See you next week.